Okay, welcome everyone to another workshop uh, as part of the KFAST COVID-19 Hackathon workshop series. Uh, my name is Hashem Bahabahani, co-founder and CEO, uh, CEO of CODED. Uh, today we have a really special guest, uh, Mr. Frank Fineski, who's going to be with us from the United States. Uh, before I introduce Frank, I just want to take a couple of minutes to say, uh, first of all, don't forget if you are participating in the hackathon, uh, tomorrow there is a challenge briefing at 5 p.m. where we're going to reveal all the challenges before you guys get coding and hacking. So please be sure to tune in at 5 p.m. sharp. Uh, you have the link on the Discord channel as well as on the agenda that was sent to you. Um, the second kind of housekeeping note is that this is unfortunately our last workshop, but I promise you we're going to end it on a real, real high and we're going to end it with a bang because Frank has something special lined up for us, I'm sure. Um, uh, one more thing before we kick it off. Uh, always remember, if you want to ask a question, there's a little Q&A box that you can add your question to. And if you see a question on there that you like, you can upvote it, uh, comment on it. Uh, we'll have the chat disabled for now, but we'll bring it back on as soon as the Q&A starts. Uh, feel free to, um, to, ch to chime in with your insights or perspective or any comments that you might have. Okay, cool. So our speaker today is uh, Mr. Frank Tineski, who is an award-winning design leader for category creating high Sorry, revenue generating products. Uh, he has worked in numerous companies. He holds 80 domestic and foreign design, UI UX, mechanical and process patents. Over his, over his career, he's worked in several large uh, corporations as well as notable startups. Uh, today, he is the Vice President of Global Experience and Design and Innovation at Kids2. Previously, he spent a decade uh, designing breakthrough products at Motorola, where he was recognized with the Design of the Decade Award for the Talk About line of two-way uh, radios, for anybody who remembers those good days. Uh, he also went up to head up Experience Design for BlackBerry, where he was responsible for creating the first consumer mobile phone products. So for all you BlackBerry users out there who remember the first uh, few BlackBerry products, if you love those, and I'm sure Kuwaitis really love those, uh, you have Frank to thank for the awesome UX uh, on those little devices. Um, not to mention that Frank also led the global consumer design and experience team at Dell. And he was also the chief design officer at LZ Labs, which is a mainframe migration data science company. So it goes without saying that over the next 40 to 50 minutes, we're gonna be blessed and we're gonna be enriched with a humongous amount of wisdom. So please pay attention because a lot of things that are gonna be said that are gonna be really helpful to the hackathon, but more importantly, beyond the hackathon for your practical uh, experience. Uh, so without further ado, Frank Tineski, the mic is yours. Wow, hey, thanks for a warm introduction. <laughs> it's, Makes me feel like I'm a hundred years old when you say those things. Uh, all the things I've done, I, ha I do have a lot of experience, that's for sure. Um, but like with all things, you know, it's it's part of the journey. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the journey I've been on and a journey I think that you're going to be taking. And um, I'm going to, I, I, you know, I've got a, a this, you know, like I've hacked this presentation. So uh, like you, I it's pretty fresh. I just wrote it. I'm going to go off camera and share some visuals with you. Uh, Uh, Frank, I think we, we lost you there. Uh, so our speaker is, I think he's facing some technical difficulties. I'll give him a sec. Okay, Frank, we see you, but we don't hear you. I think you're so muted. Uh, you okay. know, truth be told, I'm not a Zoom user. I'm a WebEx user, so <laughs> the clumsiness there, folks. Uh, I'm going to go off camera while I read this to you and and and, and move through the videos. Um, it's a fresh script, like literally I hacked it together in the last two days. So we're going to do that and uh, we're going to make it exciting. So um, now I'm going to share my 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 screen. Okay, we see the screen, Frank. Honored to be part of it. 
Um, this is my second appearance on behalf of the U.S. State Department, um, which is good because it, it makes me feel that maybe my first one wasn't terrible <laughs> because I wasn't really sure. Um, that one was on Industry 4.0 and job creation, and I had given some keynotes throughout economic zones in Brazil. And, you know, I met some really interesting people and even made some new friends. Um, and I received a lot of positive feedback. So at the time I was living in Los Angeles. So when I returned, uh, I was feeling pretty good about, you know, how things went and um, being really tired on my way home from the airport. Uh, I ended up pulling into a roadside restaurant for some food and, and it was just a roadside place. I, di I didn't really know what it was, but it actually had this crazy menu where they had, you know, American food and Asian food and Indian food and Greek food. So much stuff on the menu was crazy. Um, and I don't even remember what it is that I chose. I just remember sort of flipping open the menu and picking something from the middle. Um, and again, I, I don't even remember what the dish was that I ordered, but it was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely terrible and didn't look anything like the picture in the menu. Uh, but here's the thing, like, when my, when my server came to my table, uh, which they often do, and asked, you know, how is everything over here? Um, you know, I said, oh yeah, you know, everything's great. Yeah, it's good, thank you, right? And uh, clearly that wasn't true. A and then I thought, oh no, <laughs> what if that's how things went in Brazil? What if everyone told me it was good and it really wasn't, uh, or, you know, wasn't that great? So um, it's good to be back, it feels good to do that. And um, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it, it just made me kind of laugh, I thought I would share it. Um, so again, very happy to be here, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I, you know, didn't have a lot of time to prepare for this. Um, I only had a few days. And this presentation, you know, it may not be universally loved, and that's okay. Uh, I'm not even very well rehearsed, uh, you know, and to be quite honest, um, this presentation is, is a prototype. It's, it's raw, right? Um, but sushi isn't for everybody. Um, but there's also sort of a simple ele elegance to things that are not fully baked, and, um, and things that are reduced to their purest form. So I won't be dazzling you with, you know, overbaked slides today or slick animations or, you know, bass pumping videos intended to sort of charge you up. Um, my content uh, that I could produce, by the way, in just a few days, uh, wouldn't even compare to what we see every night on the evening news. So, you know, <laughs> wow, if life is imitates art, uh, you know, thinking is, you know, considering the news, if life imitates art, it, it sure does feel like we're sort of living in a dystopian movie or, uh, or a Netflix episode of Black Mirror, uh, where the lines between, you know, fiction and nonfiction are getting increasingly more blurry. And, and, and it's hard to live at those two intersections, you know, it's hard to identify, uh, you know, what is fake news and, and what is a real issue or, you know, what is a legitimate mystery uh, versus a conspiracy theory. So I thought, you know, maybe you should know where I stand. Um, I, I'm one of those guys who have never seen a Harry Potter movie uh, or a Game of Thrones. I just haven't, you know, watched them. I, I actually prefer watching documentary films um, because I, I like them. I, I like things that bring reality into focus. And I have an office in Asia, so in Hong Kong, so, and I do a lot of work in Shanghai and areas around that area. So. Uh, you know, when we could travel, I was going to Asia quite a bit. And, and you can watch three movies on a plane ride to Asia and still have three hours to go. So, um, you know, I watch a lot of, a lot of documentaries. Um, but I watched one about a year ago um, about mountain climbing called Free Solo. And it, it chronicles a guy who climbs El Capitan without a rope. Um, and I don't know if you've seen the movie. Have you? It's sensational. Um, you know, and what's interesting about this one is, um, is you know, this documentary actually made it to, you know, U.S. cinemas and, and, and you know, the, on the big screen. So normally I have to go digging for these, you know, um, documentary films, but this one made it to the cinema. So somehow I thought it would fall short um, and, uh, and, you know, I was expecting it to kind of be, you know, kind of more like a nerdier version of a Tom Cruise th thriller, you know, sort of pander to a mass market audience. But, but thankfully, you know, Free Solo didn't do that. They didn't pander. Um, it, it was, it was, it was a really great movie. And um, unlike most movies I watch on, at the big screen, I, I didn't sort of 
haphazardly plow through this like giant oversized box of American popcorn. Uh, I couldn't do it <laughs> uh, because, you know, uh, I, was, I was expecting to sort of be passively entertained, but somehow my unconscious mind sort of knew that what I was watching on screen um, wasn't created with sophisticated computer animation or graphics. Um, the realness of every death-defying moment in that film, you know, the, the holds and, and the leaps and the stuff that were just, you know, one slip and, and the guy was going to die, um, it had me twisting and turning, kind of like, 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 like an escape artist trying to wiggle out of his way out of, out of a straitjacket. That's how I felt. It, it probably would have been embarrassing had I not been the only person in the empty movie theater. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it was just, it was incredible, but the sense of danger was intensely real to me, the observer, right? I sort of had this involuntary response to what I was watching. And, you know, in a similar way, you know, people of all nations are trying to respond to the dangers of COVID-19. Um, I think we recognize that, you know, one slip up, like, you know, rubbing your eyes or, or not washing your hands could have deadly consequences. Um, but, it, you know, it's hard, to, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine that, right? It's hard to observe that danger when, when your fingers that you haven't washed are clinging to the side of a mountain, right? Where if you slip, you literally slip. Um, not just you forget to do something and slip up and, and don't comply. Um, you know, and, and we can see this, you know, as the death tolls rise still in some areas, um, some are choosing to carry on with their life as usual, best they can and snubbing their noses at masks and, you know, engaging in social activities and public entertainment best they can, while others are still, you know, sheltering in place. And, and this group is sort of clinging to the mountain, right? They're sort of clinging to the side of the cliff and they're sort of paralyzed in fear and, you know, glued to the news. And, you know, and, and the news only gives you a look down, you know, it's sort of designed to terrify you. So, um, you know, perhaps the polarization of these two groups, you know, the the people who are truly committed to compliance uh, and the others are sort of just going about their lives, maybe these two groups would be less extreme if somehow the dangers of COVID-19 were observable by the human eye. Um, you know, under, under a microscope, the virus looks kind of scary. It, it rather resembles a puffer fish, which is kind of ironic because both are deadly to humans if not prepared properly. Um, you know, but our primitive brains are, are programmed to evaluate observable dangers, you know, and, and when we see them, it often initiates a mechanical response. Uh, you know, and hey, I, I'm sure there's been a time when you've been sort of, you know, surprised by a spider and involuntarily jumped out of your skin for a moment, right? At, at the sight of a big spider. But, but, but most spiders are, are pretty harmless and, um, and their appearance is what scares us. Now imagine all the unobservable dangers in our world and in our bodies that, that you know, can't make us jump simply because we can't, we can't observe them. And if we can't observe them, then they can't scare us. Um, so it makes me think, you know, how might our global ecology be different if somehow the carbon monoxide emissions from cars is observable through the, you know, special glasses? Imagine if every tailpipe could, look, you know, could be observed as a tiny smokestack what might a traffic jam look like? And, um, you know, would there be any climate change deniers if that, if that were possible? So we've got these, you know, we've got these two groups, right? And, and, and you, we have to, you know, we have to know our position. We have to understand what the right position is because, you know, it's, it's, we're sort of at this intersection of, you know, do we, do we pinch our noses and dive into the harsh reality or do we, you know, sort of escape into the ethos of fantasy, fantasy, right? Is it, is a sort of fiction or nonfiction, and and you know both options are seductive and immersive in their own ways, um, but in very different ways, and um, and both are, are actually necessary because you know change kind of resides you know at this um, at this intersection where reality collides with imagination. Um, you know we have to deal with the real problems, but we also have to imagine what a brighter future might be like, and then collectively construct it. Now, uh, you know, for myself as a designer of physical things and digital experiences, the changes I encounter normally are tangible. Um, the problems I solve have mass and gravity and, you know, every component can be assembled and disassembled and, and studied and, and ultimately improved upon. Um, and the interactions with the, uh, these objects through the interfaces, you know, they typically require a physical, dinner, dig, physical or digital interface which is, you know, even if it's coded, is, is still, you know, observable 
and usually tactile. So, um, you know, you guys are going to be working on this hackathon where you're going to be building these things. And ultimately, you know, your final design should empower the end user to sort of confidently climb, you know, around and through your user interface while enjoying the view, you know, safely. Um, but this will probably have to come later, you know, after several generations of your prototype code. Um, so your first mission is to kind of find this new path forward, right, up the mountain and, you um, and set the pros, and um, and the pros is what you know the climbers, uh, climbers who go up the mountain first. They, they they set these metal cleats in the cliff, and and they make it safe for future climbers. Um, the pros is what future climbers you know, attach their safety ropes to. So you know I applaud you for taking on this challenge. You know when you could have talked yourself down, um, and that's a pretty cool thing. So you're setting the pros and setting the path for for this whole challenge. And it's really great to, to be part of that. So let me stop you guys there because I, um, you could probably tell that I had recorded this and um, as part of my hackathon. Um, and I wanna see if there's any questions that you guys have uh, up, up to now. Yeah, I think we'll 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 get those questions flowing uh, towards the end. Uh, Funny. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to go back in time a little bit because I actually think I'm on the wrong vintage of uh, of my of my track. Um, so hang with me one second. Would that be okay? Absolutely. All right. Cool. Hang with. Okay, so in, in pure hackathon fashion, uh, I my, my demo <laughs> failed. <laughs> you know, I recorded this last night at about, uh, I finished about four in the morning and I had it all tuned up and ready to go and I, I managed to push the wrong button. Imagine that, right? It all, it's all it takes. Well, let me, let me take it where I left off and hopefully this will still hold together for you. You guys still hearing me? Yep, we're good. And you know, both options are seductive and immersive in their own ways. Um, but in very different ways. And, um, and both are, are actually necessary because, you know, change kind of resides, you know, at this, um, at this intersection where reality collides with imagination. Um, you know, we have to deal with the real problems, but we also have to imagine what a brighter future might be like and then collectively construct it. Now, uh, I, you know, for myself as a designer of physical things and digital experiences, the changes I encounter normally are tangible. Um, the problems I solve have mass and gravity and, you know, every component can be assembled and disassembled and, and studied and, and ultimately improved upon. Um, and the interactions with the, uh, these objects through the interfaces, you know, they typically require a physical dinner, dig, physical or digital interface, which is, you know, even if it's coded is, is still, you know, observable and usually tactile. So, um, you know, you guys are going to be working on this hackathon where you're going to be building these things. And ultimately, you know, your final design should empower the end user to sort of confidently climb, 
you know, around and through your user interface while enjoying the view, you know, safely. Um, but this will probably have to come later, you know, after several generations of your prototype code. Um, so your first mission is to kind of find this new path forward, right, up the mountain and, um, and set the pros. And, um, and the pros is what, you know, the climbers, uh, climbers who go up the mountain first, they, they, they set these metal cleats in the cliff and, and they make it safe for future climbers. Um, the pros is what future climbers you know, attach their safety ropes to. So, you know, I applaud you for taking on this challenge, you know, when you could have talked yourself down. Um, and that's a pretty cool thing. So you're setting the pros and setting the path for, for this whole challenge. And it's really great to, to be part of that. So the world is really in need of, of more of these, you know, visionary leaders. Um, and God knows we need a lot more of them. Um, and if you think about it, there are just, you know, numerous um, people throughout history who have, you know, improved life and the human condition by way of their courage and leadership um, in every category, you know, art, science, technology, culture, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, each category seems to have, you know, one or a few uh, iconics, right? Like if it's uh, science, it's probably uh, Einstein, right? Um, but it's also important to recognize that a lot of these icons were also supported by, you know, other, you know, visionary, like-minded, courageous people who had skin in the game. You know, they didn't go it alone. They had a sport system. Um, and I think that um, their contribution will largely go uncelebrated. You know, think about it. Like for for every Steve Jobs, you know, there's a Steve Wozniak, right? Uh, certainly less celebrated, uh, but not any less important. Um, and if you think about the, you know, sports staff who absorbed those challenges, um, those visionary ideas and made them real, you know, all of those people who are unsung heroes, right? Who were part of the collective energy that changed the mobile ethos. Um, and their contributions are lasting, you know, that the products will, will, will be obsoleted, uh, but the energy won't go off like a light switch. It'll be part of the, you know, the ethos. Uh, and I would say that if you go way, way back, um, we're still enjoying the afterglow of a culture of innovation in America uh, that started on the East Coast and, you know, included early pioneers trucking across the country in a covered wagon. Can, can you imagine how terrifying that must have been to go into the un unknown and, and not stopping until you reach the golden shores of California? Um, and I would argue that, you know, the, the pioneering spirit is still very alive and well in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's also a place where, um, you know, California is, is, is a place where a lot of trends and a lot of style and a lot of sports and a lot of you know, innovation is born. Uh, it's the pioneering spirit, right? Um, Elon Musk came from, you know, South Africa to, uh, to the California, right? So California is our explorer state. I live there. I don't live there now, but I certainly felt that energy when I was there. I applaud you for taking on this challenge, you know, when you could have talked yourself down from it. You know, most would say, you know, the mountain is too steep, uh, the ledges are too narrow, and I couldn't blame you for, you know, thinking this way. Uh, this is a real life Mission Impossible and not a fictional project, right? Um, and yet you're here anyway, you know, partly because you're probably a little crazy uh, in a good way, um, but you also have the courage to step up and, um, you know, you could be home or anywhere else pacifying yourself with a feel-good story about how you could have done this and that it would have been no, no sweat for you, right? It would have been easy, um, but you were just too busy or that you already made other plans or something. So you're here, and in my view, you've already stepped into the ring of success, and um, now you're among other courageous, you know, explorers. And it doesn't matter if your team wins; uh, trophies tarnish, they collect dust. It's really the meaningful connections that um, that you'll make sure that you know can germinate new friendships, and those can last a lifetime. You know, because you are among other like-minded explorers, a handful of you may even link up and be the founders of a new business or enterprise together. You just never know. So as we're about to kick things off, you know, some of you might be thinking, you know, what if I find that I'm uh, out of my depth, right? What if I'm unable to adjust or climatize to the altitude, right? Um, unable technically to climatize quickly enough to, you know, keep up with my teammates. Um, maybe I won't reach the summit. What if I fail? 
in my own experience, you know, the people that I admire who aspire to have more, be more, and give more, um, they know this can happen. They don't want it to happen, uh, but they know if they're striving for excellence, it's going to happen. Uh, sooner or later, uh, you're going to meet yourself on the mountain, right? And you're going to find out what you're made of. So, um, you know, if you're fortunate, you can have many years of consecutive upward success, but eventually you're going to face an impasse where you won't be able to go any higher. And, you know, I found myself in this metaphorical situation, you know, ironically, <laughs> while I was watching the documentary Free Solo about climbing, you know, I, I suppose that mountain climbers, they just keep going up. I'm not a climber myself, so I thought that just makes sense. You just keep going up and up and up. How hard can it be? Well, in reality, they don't. Um, climbers go up as far as they can, uh, and when they hit an impasse, um, they often must traverse the mountain both sideways and down, like a lot, uh, just to get to the next path, you know, up, um, which is really, you know, the only way to climb El Capitan. So, you know, it's not mentioned, by the way, in the film. It's not the point of the film. Uh, but to me, this path is a metaphor for our own ascension. So now I want you to imagine that, right? I want you to, you know, if you're listening to this, I want you to draw this path in your head. Imagine your stock's going up and up and up. It's climbing, you know, you're going up the mountain and suddenly it's going, you know, sideways and down quite a bit. Um, imagine what that looks like, you know, to a corporation, right? It, it, it looks like, um, it looks like, you know, uh, a losing proposition on their balance sheet, right? You're, you're losing. Uh, to an individual, it's highly personal. You know, it, it, going sideways and down, uh, it comes with hardship. It comes with loss of ego and status, and um, it's terrible. It makes you feel terrible. Um, to a nation, it could seem like the erosion of our freedoms. So this metaphor also scales from individual to, you know, company to uh, nation. Um, but, you know, to, to the truly courageous, uh, it's just a necessary part of the process. It's just part of the journey. Um, so on your own journey, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, your project is sure to hit some impasses. Uh, expect your prototypes to be frustratingly buggy. Um, don't be discouraged if you have to go sideways and down to find the next path up. So stay flexible. You know, um, you know let your imagination and your creative problem-solving abilities uh, run freely and without fear of judgment, and, and don't pass judgment on others. You know, expect um, that you know, you're going to make mistakes. Expect someone on your team to let you down or drop the ball. This is going to happen. Um, it's part of the process. You know, it, it's not unlike the scratch you get on your car um, or, you know, a crack that you discover in a, a perfect vessel or vase. Um, when those things happen, we say, you know, that really sucks, um, which is a bit crude, but it's also fitting because it describes how we feel when uh, something we value is sucked out into that empty space. Um, but here's the deal, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, practically every science fiction movie I've ever seen that happens in space has some situation where there's like this crack in the bulkhead and, you know, uh, things are flying around and they're either getting sucked out of the spaceship and, and it's the epic hero who emerges uh, with a clever solution. Imagine how much it must have sucked for Steve Jobs. He was sucked out of his own company, the company he founded, right? Imagine the public humiliation the despair he must have felt. Um, and, you know, no doubt he went sideways and down for a little while, um, but he didn't let himself free fall, right? He could have, he had every excuse to do it, um, but he stayed on the mountain and he eventually came back and took Apple to the summit. It's, it's a really, uh, that's a hero's journey if there ever was one. Now uh, think of Martin Luther King, right? And the hole he plugged in our spaceship called racial inequality. Uh, you know, he didn't anonymously throw bricks uh, from afar, although I, I got to imagine he wanted to do it, right? Things were terrible. Uh, but when things really sucked in America, Dr. King threw himself, you know, into the problem with both his head and his heart. And he illuminated the new path forward. Um, you know, he stopped the whole nation really from bleeding out, uh, tragically was unable to complete the surgery. And now that's on us to do and to complete his work and, and certainly had a lot of work to do. Uh, but what a leader. So the world is really in need of, of more of these, you know, visionary leaders. Um, and God knows we need a lot more of them. Um, and if you think about it, there are just, you know, numerous um, people throughout history who have, you know, improved life and the human condition by way of their... Okay, so I'm going to stop right there because clearly I'm no DJ. <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, I'm going to share my video and take you through the rest of it because there's going to be some redundancy there. 
Um, but you probably see the trend line, right? Um, it, it takes a lot of courage to do this kind of work. And, um, and now I wanna show you, and, and I also um, wanna share with you um, something that I wanna, I think is kind of interesting because um, it was my best intent to sort of do this in a real cool way, like a DJ style way, a, a, a hack kind of way, but I don't think uh, my prototype is working as well as I, I nearly hoped it would. Um, but I still hope you're extracting the value. Now, look, when you, when you guys are, are gonna be prototyping um, your products, you're gonna run into a lot of time constraints and you're not gonna be able to, typically might not be able to follow the normal path you would take on a development you know, process. And um, here's a cool way, a cool hack that still exists today. You, you, you're probably seeing this iPhone on the screen and you know, the little neon green thing that indicates its status. Um, you know, that was a hack, right? Now, it's really hard to, to, to share a, a, a digital hack. They're harder to, harder to describe or, or communicate, right? So visuals work, uh, but this is a physical hack. And the way this hack came about was, is kind of interesting and you'll never see it again after I tell you, it's kind of interesting story. So um, the company was Proctor Silex and they made, um, you know, percolator coffee makers at the time and the model maker who was there was in charge of making all the physical prototypes for the design team. And that model maker fell ill uh, and wasn't able to do what he would normally do, which would be the wire of the coffee maker with uh, an, L, you know, a, an incandescent light bulb and a lens, right? That was what all their products had, a light bulb and a lens indicate the status of the product. So because the, the model maker fell ill and wasn't able to complete the project in time for review, one of the designers on staff took a piece of fluorescent tape and, uh, and used it to plug the hole, right, where the light should be. And it ended up being that the, uh, the, the, the engineering team and you know, cost, cost containment team looked at it and said, that's a great way to reduce the cost. We can, we can eliminate the wires, we can eliminate the lens, we can eliminate the bulb. You know, so sometimes going fast and hacking you know, can actually lead to you know, some pretty lasting ideas. You know, the, the incandescent bulb is gone, um, but we have you know LEDs now. But you know this this idea remains, and it, it's on automobiles, it's on all kinds of product and so forth. So I thought that was pretty cool to share. Um, so the other thing that I want to share with you guys, you know, the, the theme of this, which I managed to completely blow, <laughs> and this, my demo didn't work. Um, but anyway, the, one of the things I wanted to lead up to for you today was to help you understand that, you know, you guys are a pretty rarefied group. You know, you're, if you're doing this kind of work, um, you're, you're truly, you know, rarefied individuals. And, to, and you know, to help you understand uh, maybe with a little more clarity and also, uh, to, you know, what, so I, I, I kind of categorize, you know, you guys or, and myself as explorers, right? We're exploring new territory, we're doing new things. Um, so explorers are rarefied and help you understand, you know, your segment and also, to help you understand how trends become, can become mass market, you know, uh, successes. I'm going to ask that you go back a little while in history to what it was like to be a high school student or a teenager in school. Now, if you, if you go back in memory there, you're probably going to remember that there were a lot of social groups, right? There were cool kids and there were, you know, there were uh, good looking kids and popular kids on sports and, and uh, you know, and, so forth, right? And nerds and jocks and all that. But for the purpose of uh, this conversation, let's just say we're gonna you know, reduce it down to three segments. And, and then this will make sense. And I, I promise you it'll be relevant. Um, but the largest group of teens in school is called status quos. And the status quos are the average. They have uh, average looks. Uh, they come from families that have average income. Um, and it means they probably have, you know, average product. They probably have, you know, uh, a secondhand phone, um, uh, you know, a, a used laptop. It, it, now, they might put stickers all over it because, you know, they, they want that product to sort of look cool. Uh, everyone wants to be the coolest kid in the coffee shop, but they can't afford an iMac, right? So this group, which represents, you could say this group represents um, the total available market or the mass market, is, is, is observing, um, the, this smaller group called visibles. And the visibles are uh, the students that could afford, you know, new stuff. They have a new phone, a smartwatch, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, designer clothes and so forth. Um, and the visibles sort of drive trends into the status quo market. So 
if a visible um, wears, uh, you know, shower sandals with socks, right, which um, always makes me crazy when I see that trend. Um, if, you know, if a visible does that, then it becomes a huge trend uh, for status quo. Um, but you got to ask yourself, you know, the visibles aren't inherently a, a, an inventive group. Uh, they can be, I suppose, they're, you know, but they're essentially not. Um, so how do the visibles get their trends, right? How do they, how, do, how does something cross over? Uh, and it's explorers, you know, and it's explorers, you can see, is a, a, a much, much smaller segment of, you know, people who, um, who do their own thing. Uh, they're not worried about what people think or, um, or what the current trend is or, or the judgment on what it is they do. So um, a good example of this is when, when I was growing up in the late 70s, um, you know, skateboarding wasn't even a sport. Like it, it was just something that weird people do, right? Like weird people ride skateboards. Um, but somewhere along the line, a visible adopted, the, you know, the sport and, uh, and it became a national trend. Now skateboarding's an Olympic event. So, um, you know, explorers are really um, driving a lot of trends, setting the these new territories, and essentially doing what you guys are doing is finding new ways and new pathways forward. So, you know, that um, is an important part of, you know, how things are birthed and, and, and channeled in through, through our industries and how culture is created. Um, and, you know, to do that, uh, so I'm going to assume that, you know, you guys possess the character traits of an explorer because you're creators, right? You're, you're, you're making new things, you're developing new things, you're, you're, you're probing new territories. So as you embark on this hackathon, um, I'm probably willing to bet that you already have some ideas. You might even feel like be feeling the anxiety of having to have new ideas because there's not a lot of time. So whenever you embark on one of these projects, you're gonna be pushed in, inside and internally and externally to sort of come up with ideas really quickly. Um, but I wanna take you through this process uh, of product development called you know, MD-PISA, um, Mess, Data, Problems, Ideas, Solutions, and Acceptance. And um, to kind of lay this out for you, I, I really want you to recognize that ideas are number four, right? It's, you're not starting with ideas just yet. Um, it's okay if you have ideas, but as you begin to think like, how am I gonna solve you know, this problem or challenge or, or what is it that I'm gonna build or prototype? You know, it's, really, it's really important to understand the mess first. So the mess is essentially a collection of, uh, it's a surveying what, what's happening you know, from, a, from a wide camera view, what's happening in the category work you're looking at. And, to dissect the mess, I typically just use post-it notes. I just, you know, jam them on the wall. Uh, don't be discerning about what it is that, you know, goes up on the wall because you're gonna sort that out later, but um, it's okay. You just, you just kind of flush out what's happening. Industry trends, um, it, it's almost like one of those, um, if you've seen a police forensics movie where they, they have all this stuff on the wall and they're trying to solve a mystery, it's a bit like that. It's, pretty dis it's, pr it's, a, it's a disparate collection of stuff ideas, trends, events, disruptors, et cetera, and relative to the category of work you're exploring. And, um, and you know, if the mess represents um, like a plate of spaghetti, uh, then the data is where you're going to straighten out the noodles and make sense of it all. So you're gonna look at all the mess and you're gonna say, what's the relevant points of, 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 uh, of data that's in there? And I, I suppose sort of similarly to the way they, they kind of solve mysteries, they make strings between things, right? You've seen that in, I'm sure, in a police drama series or something. Um, in a similar way, you're doing that. You're, you're kind of making the linkages between um, what's really relevant in the mess and where are the connection points and what, what unlike things might come together. The collision of two disparate ideas might actually transform an idea. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the goal is to um, come up with a problem statement or a couple of problem statements. You don't want to have too many, but now you have a clear understanding of really what it is you need to solve, right? Now, I gave you an example earlier on. Um, you know, what if COVID was observable, right? Um, now, I don't think you're going to design special glasses to do that, right? That's, that's one of those lofty float away ideas. Um, but is there something contextually that can happen there? Or um, could it drive awareness in a different way? Now, that's for you guys to figure out. But uh, if, you, if you can really uh, get a waypoint on the problem with some clarity, then it's going to be really much better for you to uh, drive ideas 
and, um, and you know, create ideas, divergent ideas that are relevant to the problem, right? And uh, that's probably as far as you guys will go in the hackathon. Of course, after you have the ideas, you sort of down select and, um, and, and you know, build solutions. I guess you'll be you know, prototyping. So those, those count for solutions. And then you test for acceptance. So with about 15 minutes left to go, uh, I want to leave some time for Q&A. And I really wish this went smoother. Um, but I hope you got something out of it anyway. And um, I learned that I'm not the best hacker of presentations. Um, this was my first time doing it this way. So I'm trying to find new ways. And of course, I hit my own impasses, which is ironic, because I talked about that uh, on, this, uh, on this journey we were on together. So with that, I'll open it up to some questions. All right, thank you, Frank. Um, I think if you could uh, please stop sharing the screen so that we could uh, kind of refocus it. Thank you. Uh, I think I think despite the, uh, the 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 minor technical difficulties, it was it was a great presentation, and the you know we we got the uh, the the main vision and ideas behind it, uh, and I think we can we can now open it up to questions, and I'm sure some of our audience members have. Have questions that they'd like to ask. Um, I want to kick it off by just kind of taking taking it from where you left off, uh, Frank, when you talked about the, the I forgot the acronym, but the the, the process that you mentioned. Uh, I think a lot of our hackathon participants, but also generally in, in a startup setting, especially uh, people can sometimes be intimidated by. Yeah, as you put it, you might have anxiety about having to get a new idea, but sometimes people might be intimidated by the problem itself. And, you know, we're talking about here with, with COVID, talking about real problems. These aren't trivial problems or sort of, you know, maybe serious problems. These are problems that can have potentially, you know, huge impact on people's lives. Yes. How would you advise, how would you advise these entrepreneurs, these designers, these coders to get over that intimidation and get their creative juices flowing so they can come up with really good ideas? Well, you know, that's a, yikes, that's a really good question. Um, the intimidation factor can really, um, it can paralyze you, right? Um, but you're building prototypes, right? So um, the consequence uh, it isn't really, it really isn't that, that big yet, right? It's, it's when you have to go through the, you know, clinical trials or commercial validation or, you know, product integrity, all, you know, there's, whenever you go to deploy a product, there's plenty of, you know, safety measures in place to help you manage through those types of things, you know, in, depending on the category, it could be highly regulated, regulated, you know, um, I design products now, and I design a lot of products for children and families, and, um, and the consequence of, of, you know, a child being hurt is, you know, is, 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 is you know, severe as it gets, right? Um, and also the legal consequences for that are really high because um, you know it, it's uh, you have to be very careful um, and yeah. you, you just don't want to hurt anybody. But you also have to be really inventive. So you know I think that for for me and in the teams I lead, I I think we try to go boldly into the unknown, um, knowing we might fall down, knowing we we might not um, you know achieve what it ultimately what you want to do. But we have to keep pushing the threshold because you know it's like a rubber band. It's like when you stretch it. Uh, you know, it returns back to shape, but it's still a little stretched. So you really have to stretch far, right? To 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 move a little. You have to you have to stretch a lot to move a little, if that makes sense. Um, and if you're stretching into unknown territories, uh, you're going to be inclined to turn around or or, or head that back down the mountain, right? And you, you hit those impasses, or you bump up against that you know that threshold where you, where you just can't figure it out and you don't know what to do. And it's kind of a game of perseverance or, or persistence. You have to really, you know, make good decisions. You could, you, of course, you can keep bumping up against the idea for too long, and that's not good either. Um, but um, I would say that the best thing to do is, if you have the idea, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in, you know, uh, observational research and con contextual inquiry. Um, and, and those are really, um, you know, they can they can they can help you steer around these things. As an example, I mean, you mentioned BlackBerry. So so, you know, when you know doctors were a uh, a segment of users who who used a lot of Blackberries in, in in hospitals, right? And doctors using them, and you know, doctors have really complicated words to spell, like mesothelioma, right? Can you imagine? You might have to type that fifteen times a day. 
in the butt that would be, right? So when you get into the heart and mind of the user and, and you actually sort of try to not just, you know, read it, but actually get out there, you know, um, and understand. Then you go, wow, you know, there's a feature where we could put it in a UI where you type M three times and it auto populates. And now you just gave that doctor, you know, more time in his or her life, right? You um, increase the delight they feel with the product. Um, so when you bump up against, you know, things that are concerning about, you know, safety and stuff, the best thing to do is, is really get into the problem, not from afar, um, but, you know, but really get in there. And of course, you know, I, I mentioned the, the, the contextual research from, from uh, uh, segmentation research. I, I believe it was Cheskin research that did that segmentation study. I mentioned the MDPSA process, the, the mass data problems, ideas, solutions, and acceptance. Uh, that's from the Creative Problem Solving Institute in New York. Um, you know, and you got to know the heady stuff, right? You got to know um, the process, but you got to make sure you get out of the office or out of, you know, I guess now it's out of your basement or wherever you might be, your home, as much as you can and get into the field. Um, some, some great examples would be, you know, people who have restricted their own movement um, by, you know, wearing, you know, gloves with tape on them and, and putting Vaseline on their glasses, right? To smear the camera view through their, through their eyeglasses to simulate what it would be to be somebody who's, you know, elderly, right? Um, so, you know, those types of things are sort of contextual inquiry and, and also look for compensatory behaviors as well. Um, when I was designing, you know, commercial and government two-way radios um, for Motorola, uh, a common thing was, um, you know, people would mark, it was a shared product. So you might have a shift, right? You might go on the, on location, you might use one of these products and, um, and then that you put it back in the charger and somebody else uses it. Well, people were marking those up with like nail polish or, or putting, you know, putting yeah. notes on them and so forth. Um, that sort of says, wow, you know, what if, uh, what if you solve those problems? So look at the hacks that people are doing in the products they have already. Um, and that could be another interesting way to, uh, to sort of unearth interesting ideas. I want to go back to something you mentioned, which is actually going out, leaving your basement or apartment or wherever it might be these days. I mean, if you, if you can do that and kind of observing people, uh, beside, you know, beyond just the current situation that we're in right now, uh, Abdelaziz here is asking, what are the best practices in observing a situation to find good solutions? Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I think that is a, a there, there's two potential things, you know, observing, observing a, um, a, a, a a market segment that you believe exists is more difficult than observing one that does exist, um, right. because you know if if you, like you could, if if the market exists already, you can you know you can go out and you can research what, how people are using it. You know, um, for example, in the in the mainframe migration um, company that I led in Switzerland, um, you know, we had users who were in their 70s who were using COBOL, right, and mm -hmm. we're developing technology to offload, you know, that um, the, the COBOL code and, and PL1 and BB2 and all that stuff to open systems, you know, architecture, x86. So you, you have two very disparate user groups. You have legacy users who are in their 60s and 70s who, you know, not many people going to, you know, uh, university now to study COBOL, right? It's just, you know, it's a yeah. dead switch essentially. Um, but you've got all these, you know, legacy companies that are still using it. Um, so in that situation, you know, you've got an end user group that's, you know, 60s and 70s, and then you've got another user group who who's, needs to use it, but they're in their 20s and 30s, right? So, so profoundly different, right, in terms of, you know, how they want to use the product. So you really have to study and be conscious of the guardrail conditions or the climate in which, you know, you're involving and try to immerse yourself in them because, you know, one part of that gender segment, you know, they grew up on the internet, right? They were born on the web and another didn't. So, um, and, you know, also uh, even the acronyms and stuff like, you know, um, AWS means something completely different to a web, web, you know, to a, to a mainframer than it does to, you know, to us, it's, you know, Amazon web service. Right. So, so, you know, there's, what do you do, right? You know, you're trying to bridge um, and that, that represents a, a really, um, a really challenging situation for developing a UI like that because if the UI is quarantined, probably not the right word, segmented to one, you know, um, yeah, segmented to one user group, it's much easier to um, to sort of unpack, if you will, 
the, the user requirements of, of a very narrow segment. If, if you told me, hey, um, I want you to design a UI for, you know, Mountain Dew drinking, skateboard riding, you know, millennial youth, and uh, yeah, okay, cool. I, I can put shape into that. Um, it's when you try to design accessibility for everybody, um, that becomes a more difficult challenge because you bump up against those contextual problems. And that's actually a great segue to a question that we see here from Ghali. He said, how, how do you strike that balance between accessibility and expedience in design? Hmm. Well, I mean, when uh, accessibility and, you know, like user, like, like, I guess accessibility um, can have a different, you know, there's a couple ways to uh, can absorb the word accessibility. I'm going to think it's like accessibility, meaning it's available to everybody and expediency. Um, well, that's a good question. I have to think about that one. Um, you know, the the, the UI it, accessibility, um, I think that, you know, the, the, of course the goal is they ought to be both, right? They ought to be both accessible and expedient. Um, and, you know, and, and we've seen solutions for that in, in, in ways in which you can hover and stuff and get more, so you, you know, so, that, so the, the person who wants to have a really zippy user experience, um, can do it. Um, you know, a, a great example, one of my favorite examples of, of that is um, a user interface developed by, um, I think it was Bill Buxton from, from Autodesk. Um, there's a sort of a, a UI that's kind of radial, right? So there's, you know, there's all these menus in a CAD program and normally you got to go up and select, right? And But he, he created a gestural based UI. So if I have a, if I have, you know, a set of tools that I always use and, and I use this program quite a bit, it's called Alias. Uh, I can just gesturally base get to my get to the tools I want. So when you look at the total tool shelf of available stuff in this program, it's 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 crazy. It looks like a NASA you know um, uh, switchboard, right? It's it's got hundreds of controls and features. But um, through the expediency of accessible accessibility to the, to the tools that matter to me, uh, they did that by creating a gesture based UI, right? So if you're if you're if you're a legacy user and you want to go into the you know traditional way of using it you can follow those linear steps but if you're a more advanced or a more courageous user you can do it with a gesture based ui i don't know if that helps yeah or answers the question i mean it, it, it is, i think it's a deep topic and you know i, I think that answer uh, kind of gets the, the the ball starting in that conversation but obviously it needs a deeper dive uh let, let me take another question here from Abdelaziz, and I, I think it's a great question especially for the hackathon here uh these participants are going to be presented with a set of uh, possible challenges from which they can choose and i guess in real life as well when you're starting a startup you're probably familiar with a pop with a, with a couple of or maybe more problem sets and problem spaces so the question becomes then uh how do, how do you go about becoming creative and becoming innovative and finding the right solution uh, for, for what you're trying to, for this problem, for this probably intimidating problem. Is there a process, is there a method to the madness of becoming creative? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that, um, I, I think that a lot of people think they are creative. Um, I, I think, you know, no, I don't think you would find many people um, who would go about the, go around the world and say, I'm illiterate, right? Um, and yet it seems to be socially acceptable to say, I'm not creative, right? So I think the first thing, the first step in that journey is don't tell yourself you're not creative. You know, you are, right? You, you, you make creative decisions and, and thoughts all the time. Um, the thing is you really need to nurture that. You need to stop beating yourself up for thinking dumb things or, or trying new things. Look, you know, my wife's gonna ask me how things went today, right? How'd it go, right? She's gonna come home, she's out of the house, right? And to keep things quiet, she runs a business. We're all working from home. And I'm gonna say it went horrible. It was terrible. I totally blew it. You know, things things fell. I I, I couldn't find my file. The, you know, you just don't be afraid to fall down. I guess you know. Um, you know, I think what happens is I think it's really the stigma of of um, of people who, you know, I think that I think look, I think the explorer mentality or the explorer traits can be cultivated within you. Um, I think there's a segment of population that just doesn't care, right? They just don't give a, give a crap about what people think or say or do. They're truly original. And, you know, you know, where would we be without, you know, some of these people like the David Bowie's or the, you know, the princes or, or, you know, the Steve, you know, I, you know, all these people are just, they're very, they're very visible characters, but, you know, 
you know, all the people who were in the support staff that made those you know ideas become you know reality. They, they absorbed those challenges and took them on. They're they're creative too, right? They just don't get the credit for it, and I don't think they give themselves the credit for it. You know, I think that um, I encounter people who take whatever I do and make it better. You know, I, I probably am, I'm, I, in my field, I'm, I'm kind of a, one of the more visible characters, but you know, the things I do, I, I rely on a lot of people to help me uh, be creative. And, I, and I, I probably get more credit than I deserve because it's really the smart folks who make things real, right? Um, and I, I maybe have a propensity for making things, for having a vision for things, um, but uh, I, I, maybe because I have no choice, right? Like I, I'm not going to write an algorithm. Um, you know, I came up, you know, I was part of the team that came up with the algorithm for um, having, you know, two letters per key on the BlackBerry, which was part of the, um, the, the BlackBerry Pearl. You know, I was really proud to do that. But that idea, I mean, I had to get with a linguistics guy, an algorithm guy. Um, and I feel like, you know, they're looking at me and thinking, what a great idea. I'm looking at them and going, oh my God, you, you made this goofy idea real. Like, how cool is that? It's a symbiosis between the two. So I, I think, you know, the dance really is to, to dance with the other folks, um, to not be afraid to look, do, look dumb doing it, right? Um, and, and, and have those ideas. Of course, you know, we live in a structured world, so you got to be somewhat mindful of, you know, how crazy you get, right? Because you don't want to be coin the, you know, you know, you don't want to be known as a crazy person, but uh, but you can't. But there is there is a there, you know being being creative is a, is is a courageous thing, um, and you know you got to step into it, right? You got to say, well, you, and you can't limit yourself. Once you start limiting yourself, then those novel ideas you shut them down before they fully have a chance to to germinate, right? You 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 terminate those those ideas, um, and I think if you stop saying no or if you stop somebody from finishing their idea, um, you go, or even if you just say to yourself, wow, that's really, you know, you might be thinking, wow, that's a really dumb idea that somebody just put out there, but then challengers to say, say, well, you know, what if, what if we did put two letters on a key, right? Would that work? Right. And, you know, the whole idea for that BlackBerry was trying to get it to a foam form factor. This is pre, you know, uh, capacitive touch and all those things. So, you know, in my head, I'm thinking if I can only put this, you know, I'm a mechanical guy. If I can only put this phone in, in there in the vice and kind of squeeze it, you know, what would happen? And, and then, the, you know, in, in my head, I'm thinking that. How, and then, you know, it was other people that didn't say, well, that's really stupid. They said, wow, you know, well, what if we could, you know, what if we did do something like that? You know, so it's yeah. the if, what if we could, right? Uh, instead of don't shut it down too early. That, that's probably a long winded way of, of saying that, right? Just be bold and, and go to new territory. No, I love that. And, and I think uh, it reminds me of a story. Um, you know, Paul Graham likes to say the story. He says when the founders of Airbnb came in and pitched them early days, they barely had any traction. He said they looked at the founders and said, I think one of the people in the investment room said, this is the dumbest idea I've heard. Like, who's going <laughs> to exactly. let who's going to let strangers? And then yeah. when they stop and then when, when they start finding it ridiculous, maybe two or three minutes later, suddenly they ask, well, well what if, what if, like, what sort yeah. of market is out there? Yeah. What sort of product can we build? And, you know, yeah. it's, it's a $10 billion company today. Yeah. So it just shows and, you, yeah. And, and, you know, let me build on that, right? Let me build on that. That's a, you know, you look at Uber and I look at Uber and I go, man, if I, if I were General Motors or Ford or any car company, I would make an Uber pack. I would make an Uber pack where, you know, it's, I can order wheels, trim, color, paint. Why can't I order my car with an Uber pack that has a liner that protects my trunk so that when somebody puts my luggage in, it doesn't scratch up my bumper. It has extra USB yeah. in the back. It has, you know, scotch guarded interior, right? It might even have a bucket in the back because, you know, nobody wants to drive Uber at night, right? And in, in the city, and <sighs> because people drink, that's real, right? You're not going to, you know, can't pretend that doesn't happen, right? So, but yet, the car companies are not doing that, right? Why? Uh, if you're uh, Airbnb, you know, one of the impedance that mismatches to Airbnb is probably a lot of people don't want to share their home. Um, they might not want people sleeping in their bed. Uh, is the answer to that to create uh, a mattress cover that's, you know, you know, uh, antimicrobial, so you don't feel so weird about, you know, strangers slept in my bed this weekend, right? You know, these are the things that and I, these are, you know, these are just ideas I'm, you know, kind of cranking out, you know, um, the Uber one I had before, but, uh, but, you know, this is the sort of thing when you, when you stop, when you take it to the next level, like, you know, 
you know, you're, you, you're climbing up this metaphorical mountain and you're looking for the holds, you know, um, and you're looking for something that you can hold on to. Now, sometimes you get a really good hold and, and you can pull yourself up. And other times you just go sideways and down until you find a new way up. But you've got to keep reaching. If you don't keep reaching, then you're really not climbing. You're really not you know, going anywhere. I was going to ask you for any, any last advice, but I think that that puts it perfectly. And I love the phrase, to be creative, you got to be courageous. Uh, we're unfortunately out of time, Frank. Thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you for, for, for the great advice at the end. And I think you're going to see some amazing projects that will send you way down. Make you proud. <laughs> well, you, yeah. Well, I hope you guys got something out of this. It was, it was joyful for me to do it. Um, I challenged myself to, to, you know, in new territory. I, I reached and had some stumbles, but um, thanks for hanging with me. Uh, I'm honored to, you know, participate and I wish you all the luck and enjoy and, and, and just crazy respect for what you guys are doing. I, I think it's really neat that you're putting yourself into this work. Much Thanks love. Thanks so much, Frank. And it was a great journey to be with you today. Thank you to all our audience for, for hanging around with us. Uh, and remember, if you're in the hackathon, 5 p.m. tomorrow for the challenge briefing, uh, rest up, have a really great night of sleep. Don't, don't stay awake too late uh, so that you can have all your creative juices to design amazing products tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you, Frank. Thank you to our audience and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Ciao. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.